On Tuesday, 28th of January, 1986, at 11 a.m., the NASA, among the smartest people on Earth, decided to launch the Space Shuttle Challenger. Despite many warnings and alerts coming from uh, different people, among them, the producer of the booster, Morton Tycol, said this is too cold, do not launch. Still, the NASA decided to launch for several reasons that we know today. Um, and they were taking for the first time, Krista McAuliffe, a teacher to the space. We know what happened later on. Nobody came, seven people died, including somebody I used to run into, Ron McNair, who was doing his PhD at MIT, who was living in, uh, in Boston. And we could wonder why smart people take sometimes biased decision. Good morning, everyone. Good evening, depending where you're joining from. My name is Sam Abadir. I'm professor of uh, leadership and negotiation at the International Institute for Management Development, better known as IMD in Lausanne, Switzerland. I will also be the faculty running this webinar with my esteemed colleague, Dr. Marta Witz, who will be also moderating question. I will start here by saying that crisis management cannot be taught. It has to be learned. And it's not like uh, from a caterpillar to a butterfly journey. You know, caterpillar to butterfly takes from five to 20 days. Uh, crisis management is much more like the road to Damascus. It's full of pain. It's also full of gain, joy, hiccups, disappointment, and so on and so forth. And as we go, we have to do what we call sense-making. We have to adapt as we go, because uncertain information, um, we don't know what we don't know about uh, people behavior under stress. Let me take one or two minutes to tell you what I would like to achieve with you this morning in one hour, and then five messages. What I would like to achieve is that after this webinar, all of us could take the time to stop reflect and ask ourselves, what is my contribution during the crisis and after a crisis, contribution both to my organization and to the society, which is durable, which is unique, and which is measurable? What's my contribution? So this is what I would like to achieve in one hour. I would like to leave you also with five crucial messages from crisis. Um, I come from the Middle East. Crisis is our daily DNA, um, and it ends up to be part of your parameters. You know, if you live in Singapore, maybe rain is part of your daily caution. If you live in the Middle East, maybe heat. And if you live in, in the Scandinavian countries, maybe cold. Well, if you are from the Middle East, maybe crisis end up by being just a parameter, just another variable, and you have to accept it and live with it. Five messages. First of all, as you grow senior, less and less true feedback you'll be getting. The more we grow senior, the more embellishment we'll be hearing. And we need some true feedback. And this true feedback comes either from coaches or from friends. Number two, when crisis happen, people react by reflex. When crisis happen, emotions are high. And the only thing which deal with emotion is another emotion. When crisis happen, emotions are high, logic is off. Which means what? Which means if we have been trained to hide, we will hide. If we have been trained to run, we will run. If we have been trained to shoot back, we shoot back. So if you do not train your people, don't expect them to take the right decision or the right position or the right action. They will simply do what they know. Number three, under severe stress, we cannot predict people's behavior. Under severe stress, to be honest, we cannot predict our own behavior. People can do anything. You will get surprised under stress. You think you know the people? Well, positively and negatively surprised or disappointed. Number four, during crisis, we should learn how to manage people's energy. If we can get our people to walk, we should not ask them to run. If we can get our people to sit, we should not ask them to stand. Smart people will ask you, why did you make me run? I have no more energy for tomorrow. So during crisis, please be caution on our people, energy reservoir, and manage it accordingly. Number five, and probably the most important among them all, 
Encourage your people to bring you the bad news up soon enough. Unlike wine, bad news will not get better with time. They will only get worse. So please make sure that your people are in a safe environment to bring you the bad news up soon enough. Having said that, let's get started. And I would like to take you now through another journey uh, for another five minutes. When crisis happened, people could find themselves in one of three stages. One stage is fear. And the other one is another stage just coming after fear is the learning. And the last one, which is a positive one, is the growth. Fear like being in the basement. Something happens, we feel threatened, we go to the basement. Um, the next one, growth, is being on the shop floor. So we can see the light, but we don't have a helicopter view. The growth stage is being on the R&D floor. So we can see the sun, we step back, and we have a holistic view. When we are in the basement, we have irrational behavior. We overconsume toilet paper, we overconsume food, we buy, we watch all the media, we spread all the information around us, and we spread anger too, and lots of negative feeling. When we are on the other stage, which is the shop floor, we stop spreading anger and we accept lack of control. And we try to filter our emotion and we gain some kind of maturity. But the best situation is hope, is when we go in the learning zone, what I call the R&D floor, and there is hope, which means I show empathy I make myself available and I show adaptability and sense making. So these are the three stages um, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna share a little bit. And of course, one can go from one to the other very quickly. Like one can also take his family or his company from a comfort zone to a stretch zone where miracles happen in the learning to um, a panic zone. And the whole thing is how do I bounce back to the stretch zone if I'm in a panic zone? And we'll try to cover all these. And if we cannot, then we'll do it through some chats. So this is what I would like to share with you today. And maybe one word about IMD where I have the honor to, to work. I joined IMD less than two years ago. IMD doesn't believe in um, knowledge monopoly or talent monopoly. We believe in diversity and sharing. When we share and why diverse, we have an impact. And eventually, this is our goal, to have an impact on the community um, around us. So let's get started and see how we can bring all this together. So this is the agenda I prepared for you with Marta. What we're going through, the shock, the crisis and leadership, the best practices and agility, what could change, and what we call a post-crisis crisis. I could call it a post-COVID-19 crisis, but I would like to step back and make it much more broad, a post-crisis crisis. Um, and before please you, go ahead. Before you carry on, uh, Sam, could you maybe reach to your experience on leaders' responses to the crisis? Uh, what actually makes a great leader during a crisis? And there is one question I, which specifically asks uh, uh, about the Donald Trump. Um, I will I will not speak politics, uh, but if you're speaking about this uh, person who's a leader of a big country, I think signaling effect means it all. If you are a random person like us and you signal to the market something, okay, it might be interesting. When you are a leader, you should be very conscious um, and very sensitive to what you're saying uh, because this has an impact on the financial market, on the economy. The US is the largest economy, the most powerful army, and so on. So signaling effect is pretty important. When you say, I'm going to declare war on China, or I'm going to declare war on Iran, or I'm going to pull out of Paris summit, um, these are negative signals. And I think the shrewd, experienced, seasoned leaders step back and use moderation. And if there is only one thing I would like our colleagues here listening to us to keep in mind is moderation, moderation in everything. But you ask me what makes good leader, what good crisis leader? 
I think a good crisis leader makes four aspects. Humility and confidence, but also being smart and being kind at the same time. So you have people who are humble, and at the same time, they're confident. You have people who are smart, but they're also kind. If you combine smartness and confidence, you have the daring part of our personality. If you combine kindness and humility, you have the caring part of our personality. And in crisis, we have to be a little bit sensitive to the dosage, not to be over caring or over daring. And we constantly have to play with both caring and daring at the same time. I hope this answers your, uh, your question. Thank you. And if I move to what we're going through, then uh, we'll have some other time to, to answer the question. So <clears throat> I, I prepared the graph here just to show the total cases and the amount of victim. And I made on purpose to keep an, a little bit old graph. This graph is 10 days uh, old. Um, and I made it on purpose to send the message that once the figures are so alarming, so big, so large, so shocking, we should integrate another figure with us, which is what is the curve? What is the trend? So absolute figures show us like a, a snapshot, like a balance sheet, but the trend is the PNL, and the trend help us to craft strategy. So a leader should have two things. He should have a fast brain and a slow brain. The fast brain is the one looking at figures as they are. The slow brain, the, 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 the more reflective brain should be looking at the trend because the trend help us crafting our strategy. Now, you understand what's so unique about this uh, crisis is that um, we've never been through that. And I will share with you later on uh, what I mean by that. So usually when we speak about lockdown, until now, until 2020, lockdown meant a local lockdown something very punctual. Look at Spain, look at Italy, look at France. Um, in August, if you look at the chart of manufacturing or production, it's a very sharp V-shape. Everything stopped in France, everything stopped in Italy and probably in Spain, people go on holiday. So it's a very steep V-shape. And there is nothing wrong with that for three reasons. First of all, this very steep V-shape can be budgeted. We know that people will be leaving on holidays in August. And actually, most of us, we get some kind of messages like, if you would like to place your order now to be shipped before holidays, do it before June 1st. So we know it ahead of time. The second thing, we can model it. Means we can take a V shape and turn it into a W shape. Meaning we can ask people, well, half of our resources will go on holiday first two, two weeks of August and the second half the second two weeks of August, right? So we can turn the V shape into a W shape. And we can also understand that those people who are not producing, who are not on the manufacturing side, are spending the money elsewhere. Planes, trains, boats, hotels, retail business, restaurants, and so on. In this crisis we're going through, we cannot budget it. We cannot model it. Actually, the crisis is modeling us. And there is no other spending because everything is shrinking. That's why, and I'll go through it again with another chart, this is so unique. Okay, I prepared here for you um, in what we're going through, some kind of um, an x-axis and the y-axis. One is the probability and the other one is the impact, the consequences, meaning how likely something could happen and how severe. And then I pamper a little bit. I think I've had six or seven, just to give you a flavor of what I mean. And of course, everybody could put his own um, incidents or his own event on his on his own chart. So let me share with you uh, what I've put here. A local flood. Well, this could be a low probability and a light impact, depending where you stand. An earthquake in California, high probability and um, maybe light impact because we know how to deal with it. A devaluation in one of the countries in Africa or in the Middle East or even Turkey, big country, um, as you're working with those. Um, loss of a big customer or a civil war, 
we've seen this in part of the Middle East and and of course if you have business in Libya or Syria um, this is one of your concern if somebody else doesn't have business in those countries he will push civil wars and loss of big customers or or all that to another uh, chart well the problem comes from here from those one it is very severe but probability is very low and why is this so tricky much more trickier than the one above because as it's very low probability we don't train for it as it's very low probability we don't know how to we don't drill and people do what they know and people react by reflex and those what we call black swans or other names whatever so i just wanted to shape with you a little bit how the people position themselves which means that you can be a director in a company or a leader in a company and depending where you have been promoted or transferred whatever and you will be mapping differently those things this is what we call mapping our stakeholders right if you are in 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 country in europe well doing business with a customer is relatively easy if you go to maybe part of africa then a loss of a big customer or loss of a big supplier might be different so what i would like to say is mapping is basically um, a relative issue except the one we're living through because it's global and that's one unique thing and then i added something else i added here another axis that most probably nobody look at it and this is our capacity to detect crisis it can be positive or negative positive mean i can detect a crisis ahead of time um a tsunami in japan an earthquake um in california <clears throat> and later on i would speak about the capacity of walmart to detect hurricane but sometimes this detection is negative meaning we only find out about the crisis pretty late um chemical attack chemical weapon um the crisis the covid-19 crisis our capacity to detect is very late so detection can be positive and negative now the problem becomes even bigger here because as we've never been through that if we've never been <clears throat> through this crisis before all what we know becomes smaller and smaller on the chart and the big part becomes this one the unknown and unknown and this is what we're going through everybody speculating everybody is an expert everybody would like to spread some opinion facts and so on the reality is we don't know much and the only thing we can do is to keep our sanity and to accept that we don't know what we don't know to accept that we don't control and you know what by accepting that we don't control we gain a little bit of control otherwise we might be falling into one of our biases and i will stop here to speak about our biases this is one of the things i've been teaching in the last few years we all have biases by the way um typically we are overconfident and over optimistic um to give you an example when world war 1 started in sarajevo in august 1914 both general from both sides said by christmas we're back home we know what happened later on november 1918 20 million people dead nobody was home so overconfidence and over optimistic the other thing is we are narrow minded and we are over focused on something and we don't see what we don't see and the last thing is we are a little bit risk averse when it comes to losses okay and we all have these biases and the way things are framed to us change a little bit of our, our appreciation example you can tell somebody you know what i have great news for you you have 90% chances to pass this exam to the same person you can put it in a negative frame and you tell him you know what i have bad news you have 10% chances to fail so we have biases we have framing and we have information certainty or lack of information just to close up with this what i would like you to keep in mind is the fact that as we go to uncertainty and probability uncertainty and impact all what we know behind us become a very very tiny part of what we can do of our action plan plus our capacity to detect collectively late early never and so on and so forth 
detection is very important some and there is this special kind of sensitivity sensitivity to weak signals um, and the ability to stay sensitive to weak signals could actually save our lives could you maybe elaborate on that a little bit more you're right um I have the story that I mentioned in my uh, in my classes to my uh, MBA student and to my executive about weak signals. And uh, for those who don't know it, uh, let me just share with you how powerful being sensitive to weak signals could be. Um, in France, um, there are two big car races. One is called Le Grand Prix de Monaco in Monaco, in the south of France, Monte Carlo. And the other one is Les 24 Heures du Mans, the 24 hours of Le Mans. And this is the one I'm going to share with you. On Saturday, <clears throat> June 11th, 1955, around 6 p.m. in Le Grand Prix in Les 24 Heures du Mans, uh, the head of the French team, Pierre Levesque, came driving his brand new Mercedes SLR 300 called the Silver Arrow. As he enters a pretty steep curve, he loses control, his car hits the pit, took off, X fire explodes and kill 83 people in one minute. 1,000 feet behind him, 300 meters, the world champion Juan Manuel Fangio. Also, despite being um, Argentinian, um, he's part of the French team. He's coming following Pierre Levesque, driving the same car, Mercedes LR, SLR 300, the Silver Arrow. As he's about to take the curve, he decides to stop. He pulls off. And he saves his life, the life of his co-pilot, and so on. At 7.30, the BBC is interviewing him. Mr. Fangio, what made you stop? You haven't seen the accident. He said, I am 50 years old today. It's maybe my last race. I'm the world champion. I am coming driving my most recent Mercedes SLR 300. Eight cylinders, three liters for the first time. I am driving at 205 kilometers per hour back in 55 small cars, very thin tires. I am about to take this very dangerous curve. I'm looking at the spectators and they're looking elsewhere. Something must be wrong. So I decided to stop. Do you imagine he is over-focused on his task, driving at 205 kilometers per hour, and he has the capability to look at people's behavior and decode for them. This is what I call being sensitive to weak signals, being a canary. In our companies, we have lots of elephants, people who are doers, high performance, and sometimes we don't have enough canaries, those people who are sensitive to weak signals. They see things below radar screen. So this is, Marta, what I wanted to mention about uh, being sensitive to weak signals. And there was a question or a comment uh, uh, from participants that we as individuals are somehow immune to the external threat. Uh, and at the same time, we are, as a collective humankind, uh, re we react to excessively to crisis. And I yes. believe that one of the ways to uh, overcome the uh, individual immunity to the crisis is to develop actually this sensitivity to weak signals. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> yeah, so, so two answers, really. Uh, first one is some people are born with some kind of uh, sense to detect weak signals. Um, some people can go to an elevator, they, they leave and they remember who is in the elevator, dressed how, speaking which language, and they even remember the luggage tag on your, on your, uh, on your uh, luggage. You flew Air France, Alitalia, or Etihad, or Emirates. Some people go to the elevator, they leave and they see nothing. So, but we can train ourselves. This is one answer. The other answer, which is deeper, is um, other people, our social, uh, our social capital could help us to be sensitive to weak signals. This is what we call the wisdom of crowds. And there is a very famous book, you can read it, about the wisdom of crowds. And, and the idea is that we can go from network to social capital. Let me elaborate a little bit since you asked the question. And I think this is very important. We have two types of networks. We have professional networks and operational networks. Um, sorry, private networks and professional networks. The private ones 
are our neighbors, our friends, our cousins, um, people with whom we get along, we play tennis, we go to the theater, maybe we, we go to restaurants, whatever, on the weekend. Then we have the professional network. Those people from Monday to Friday, um, you, you get along with them at work and it makes life easy. And then you have an overlap. You take people that you meet at work and you introduce them to your partner and say, you know, let me share with you um, what we're doing on the weekend. Maybe both of us, we can do something together. And then you have an overlap between professional and private networks. This is fun. It's good. But this does not change our life. What changed our life in crisis are strategic networks, what I call social capital. And they are A, B, C, D format, meaning that social capital, they have to be active, they have to be broad, they have to be connecting, and they have to be dynamic. Active mean you don't get up in Christmas and wish everybody Merry Christmas, and then you go to bed until you get up in Eastern, right? You have to do it um, all year long, and it's very tiring. It's exhausting. Number two, when I said broad, it means your capacity to speak about many people from different social and professional levels. Some people say, no, 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 no. I only speak about those who have an MBA, those who are big shots. And some other people say, no, no, my zone of comfort are those people on the shop floor. Actually, when crisis happened, the border between private and professional life is very thin. And we have to train ourselves to speak about everybody in the society. Number three, when I say connecting, meaning that my network can take me to another network. Uh, I don't know anybody in Poland, but now Marta is a dear colleague. If I need something in Poland, I go through Marta. So your, your network is connecting me to another network. With one condition, I should not be abusing of your network. And the last one, dynamic, means my network grow as I grow myself. Okay? So... I would say that collective intelligence, the wisdom of crowd, plus a social capital help us to get some moderation. Otherwise, I'm very likely to fall into one of those biases during crisis because the stress is so high, uncertain information, and so on and so forth. I hope this answers your, uh, your question. Yes, and there should be a postscriptum that I, I do come from Poland. <laughs> <laughs> So let me let me uh, share something about best practices. Uh, so until now we were what we we're going through. Let me share something about best practice. What comes to my mind really is a striking example. And this example happened in one week in August 2005 when the Hurricane Katrina hit the southern part of the U.S. New Orleans, Louisiana, part of Mississippi, Florida. Actually, Walmart they have their own emergency center, and uh, they monitor in real time, the cone of the hurricane. So they know exactly which of their distribution center or stores could be hit and when. And they take, um, they, they're very reactive and proactive on that. Actually, when Katarina hit in August 2005, Walmart played a huge role for the society, for the community, and they did fantastic from a CSR uh, point of view. Of course, Walmart is... Uh, Lots of money, more than $400 billion. So Walmart uh, probably uh, could count as um, maybe the GDP of 100 countries, right? Below 400. So huge player. When this huge player decide to do some CSR, the impact is fantastic. I will take some other more mitigated examples, but this also an eye-opener for us. When Katarina hit... Um, the southern part of the U.S., it was the duty of the FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, to act to save the people. Actually, they didn't perform brilliantly. They performed very poorly. There are 10 agencies, 10 offices around the U.S. Who performed brilliantly? The U.S. Coast Guard. The U.S. Coast Guard usually per year saves something like 3,000 to 4,000 people. On this particular week, they saved 33,000 people. And the question to you, why are two organizations, both of them part of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, one performed brilliantly and the other one basically fell on its face, performed so poorly? I think the idea, FEMA was prepared, but the U.S. Coast Guard were ready. 
and there's a very thin margin between being prepared and being ready. And what is this thin margin all about? What is the difference between oh. being prepared and being ready? And can you train yourself? Yeah. So I'm going to give you two, two answers, right? Um, what comes to my mind, first of all, there is a very thin line uh, as a leader between being confident and being arrogant. There is also a very thin line between being perseverant and being stubborn. There is a very thin line between being hard of hearing and being completely deaf. There is also a very thin line between being prepared and being ready. Being prepared is technical, is about expertise, drill. Being ready has something to do with timing and empathy. And, and when you are ready and you have you are ready with empathy, this changes. So if being prepared is about expertise and technical skills, being um, ready is about transparency, commitment, and empathy. Let me give you another example. I didn't, I, I was not going to talk about it, but I'll tell you something about not being an expert and still managing fantastically well. In September 1982, um, someone walked in a CVS store, took some Tylenol boxes, put some uh, cyanure poison in them, put them back on the shelf, and seven people died, probably buying Tylenol, using it. That was before the temper proof comes in, of course. Now, if the temper proof is ripped, you don't use it. And that was a big crisis, especially the Tylenol was the, the star drug for Johnson & Johnson. James Bourke, the CEO of Johnson & Johnson, came and he said, I am in charge. I am in charge. If I perform poorly, I have to step down. He recalled all the Tylenol from the, all the CVS stores. And then one month later, he came and he said, we invented the temper proof. So from now on, if you buy any Johnson & Johnson drug and the temper proof is ripped, bring it back. Choose it. We will supply you with another one. So they turned the crisis into innovation. The good thing is, 10 years down the road, Johnson & Johnson comes to the market with what we call over-the-counter drug, the ones you can buy um, without prescription. And um, it's called Simply Sleep, you know, the one you would take if you're boarding on a plane. You know how they marketed? By the makers of Tylenol. What is the implicit message? The implicit message is 10 years ago, you could trust Johnson & Johnson when we had the Tylenol crisis. We are using what we're doing to bounce back and you can trust us now again with the Simply Sleep. So I gave you two answers. I hope one of them makes sense to you and to the, the colleagues listening to us, but this is what comes to my mind. So US Coast Guard were ready. The FEMA was just prepared. Okay, uh, what could change? I think this is... Um, this is a very important thing. What could change from now on? I think it's a tipping point, you know? Um, what we're going through is a tipping point. Uh, it's intense, it's severe, it's massive. Um, I was just looking at the recent news, something like 20 million people in the US. You know, the US is a big country and also information is available. So it's always easy to talk about the US. Uh, 20 million people lost their jobs. This is much more than the 8.8 .8 million people who lost their jobs in 106 weeks before 2000, at, between 2008 and 2010. Only in two months, 20 million people lost their jobs compared to 8.8 .8 in two years. So this gives us what we call the tipping point. Um, Andrew Grove, the head of uh, Intel, uh, one day told us, if you miss a tipping point, you're very likely to regret it. And this COVID-19 is a tipping point, which means people have to start creating a new economy, a new finance, maybe new social habits. So on one hand, we have our values. On the other hand, we have our priorities. And we should not mix them. Values are like compass. The compass always shows north. Wherever you go, the compass shows north, at least the magnetic north, to be more precise. It's non-negotiable. And these are values, solidarity, assistance, uh, integrity, accountability. Priorities will change. So the values will only get strengthened. Maybe we should, 
I was listening to Monsieur Macron and to the Pope, actually. And both of them said, you know, by solidarity, maybe we should just cancel some of the poor country's debt. Um, it's already a crisis like this. If this health crisis takes us to um, a financial crisis, it's even worse. So maybe we should look at, within solidarity, at cancelling few debts. Priorities change. Values don't change. These are the compass. Priorities are like GPS. Um, if you want to drive to Paris, maybe, and you are in the south of France, you put your GPS north. If you want to travel to Geneva, maybe you put it east. So priorities change like strategies. Values don't change. Among the things which will change, I think, maybe our perception of China, outsourcing to China, traveling to China, or perception of the way China is in, I don't know, China is is a huge market, is a big market. This is number two GDP in the world today after the US. So this is one question. The other question is our eating, traveling habits. Last year, I just looked at the figures uh, published by the ICAO in Montreal. Last year, more than 4.5 billion people traveled by plane. Are we going to travel as much everywhere? I'm not sure. And the last thing is about politics or social capital. Who are the people on whom we could rely during the crisis? This will build the new um, net of social capital. This will build the new trust. Um, and then the way we will be judging our, our, our politicians, lawmakers, did they perform yet well, not well? I don't know. So some priorities will change. This is a tipping point. Some values will get stronger because this is also a tipping point and this is what will happen to us. Yeah. Um, a question from uh, our participants. Um, how do the leaders know that the data uh, they receive is correct? In other words, they have to navigate uh, arguments, opinions, information, uh, which may be conflicting. And what yeah. is the role of the mass media? How does the mass media shape the social perception of the crisis? Okay, so you, you're asking two questions in one question. Uh, let me just handle the media, uh, and I'll say two things. I think don't expect the media to be fair to you if you're a leader. Media is looking for a scoop. If you don't have a scoop, if you don't have bad news, um, media is not interested. Um, maybe this is an extreme opinion from my side, but this is what I've been years of research show that media is looking for a scoop. I think the new media, the responsible media, much more mature, reliable, accountable, should filter information. And by the way, there is nothing wrong with a confident, sorry, I don't know. I've never seen a media person when asked a question say, sorry, I don't know. We are always experts, expert in football, expert in finance and economics and politics, expert in everything. And nobody say, you know, sorry, I don't know. I could find the answer and get back to you, but today I don't know. So I think there is nothing wrong with the confidence. Sorry, I don't know. Now you ask me, how do leaders navigate through uncertainty? Um, I think leaders who are moderate, who are sharing, who are humble, who can step back and say, you know, what should we do collectively, have better chance to go through crisis. Does it always work? No, just human beings. But what I know which will not work is leaders who are overconfident, who are constantly over-optimistic, who are constantly narrow-minded, over-focused. Those one will behave poorly and will perform very poorly. The other one have better chance. This is what I can tell you today. Thank you. Okay. Um, I would like also on what could change to put three pillars, um, because I think that uh, these three pillars are extremely important. Um, very often we speak about survival leadership or agility leadership. I was writing a couple of years um, ago a paper with one of my esteemed colleagues, uh, Yves Doz, and we found out that agile companies have three things. They have resource mobility, how fast they can send somebody from point A to point B to help people. They have strategic sensitivity. Everybody is sensitive to the same threats or to the same opportunity. And they have global commitment. Let me start by the last one. Global commitment means you and I might argue and disagree. But once a decision is taken between both of us, in front of the outside world, we are only one team. 
So the worst thing is that we argue inside and then we go outside and we keep arguing. No, I will argue with Marta and that's positive. Uh, but once the decision is taken outside, we are only one front, unified front, okay? Um, strategic sensitivity meanings when an opportunity comes, we have to choose. There is always a trade-off. Trade-off between health and business, trade-off between safety and freedom, and so on and so forth. So we have to agree on the trade-offs. Everybody would like to live in a free country, uh, safe country, um, have a job, and so on and so forth. But imagine if the question, do you prefer safety or freedom? Then we have to make collective decision between safety. So trade-offs, and we have to agree on them. And the last one is resource mobility, is how fast I can send the doctor to Africa, how fast I can help somebody who doesn't have access to fresh water, and so on. So these are, I would say, part of the axis of progress that organization could be looking at for the future, resource mobility, strategic sensitivity, and global commitment, all of us. And then I would like to speak about post-crisis crisis. Um, and very often, crisis could be hiding another crisis. Um, and uh, one of the traps would be to think that crisis finished there, and then nothing will happen. Three examples. What about Indonesia, India, Brazil, or Nigeria? We don't get any figures of them. These are large countries, right? Um, over 100, 200 million people. Uh, and we don't know much about it. Maybe because we don't have enough tests. Maybe because uh, we don't have enough uh, cases. Maybe because the media doesn't share. Maybe the these governments don't share. Or maybe because the heat apparently is tampering a little bit the virus. We don't know. But those countries could be a post-crisis crisis. Um, people who don't have jobs could be refugees. Look what happened between Turkey and Greece or the island of Lesbos. Um, lack of job, people could be tempted to, take, to, 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 to become eventually terrorists. Um, so there is a health issue which can turn to a financial, to a social humanitarian crisis. The other one is economics. And I spoke about the US, millions of jobs, um, and nobody could see, nobody could pretend saying, oh, but you know, uh, in 2021, things will be back to normal. When you look at the yogurt and you see the expiry date on the yogurt, and it says, you know, 31st of December, the yogurt doesn't expire at midnight, sharp. There is always some kind of vague, fuzzy area. And this is what will happen. Economic will be probably a new economy, um, especially with the pressure of millennials, young people who don't understand that we're traveling nonstop, consuming nonstop, um, and so and And maybe country default, this is a mega uh, issue. So you have small countries which defaulted before, like Cyprus or Moldova. But imagine if Italy goes on default, that would be a catastrophe. Italy is a huge country, 60 million people, all the countries of Europe and almost the world are related to, to Italy. So this could be also a post-crisis crisis. And then uh, the way we are dealing with each other is pretty scary. I just looked at the last G7 in, in uh, Biarritz and the last G20 meeting in, in uh, Japan. Um, and today, the OPEC, they, they, I think Mexico doesn't agree. They seem to be aligned on prices, but not Mexico. But still big countries such as the US or China have their own agenda. And the reason why they have their own agenda is they, they have high debts, high unemployment. They have their own priorities. Uh, and these priorities are different. The problem, they are big, big countries, and everybody uh, is involved in it. And, and the, the, uh, the recent... Um, meetings show that everybody is running for himself or herself. So very little, I would say, solidarity shows up. And I would like to tell you something about when we create our own crisis ourselves. And I need to touch something on this does not happen to me syndrome. Because I think it's an eye opener today, uh, more than um, ever. Um, in April 1912, everybody remember the Titanic hit an iceberg, went down, lots of people died. When we do some kind of root cause analysis, we find out 
that Captain Smith, the captain of the Titanic, had a personal agenda. I think he was born in 1850. This happened in 1912, 62 years old. He had promised his wife, Sarah, and his daughter, Helen, to retire. And he had a personal agenda. He wanted to be to beat the record by crossing from, from Ireland to south of uh, England, to France, to Cherbourg, back to Ireland, and then to New York. He had a personal agenda. The thing is, he got three alerts from three ships saying, Captain Smith, you should be reducing your speed. We are surrounded by iceberg. This does not happen to me, Syndroma. And he kept running at 25 nautical miles per hour. Until he hit an iceberg, he went down, and we know what happened. And also he died among them. So I think crisis should just push us to reconsider this does not happen to me syndrome, which happened to smart people, the NASA, the Titanic. These are among the smartest people in the solar system. And nobody is too big to fail. So I just wanted to touch on that because this is an eye opener to all of us. Yes, and crises uh, are said to have long roots. Uh, what does it actually mean? Yeah. Um, you see, I'm going to give you an example, an episode, and I think uh, this says it all. On July 2002, I remember, I think it was 1st of July 2002 at 9 p.m., two planes collided uh, over Überlingen, over the Constant Lake. One coming from uh, the Soviet, from 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 Russia, Bashkirian Airlines, a Tupolev plane, and a DHL Boeing five seven five seven collided. Um, what we know now is that the air traffic controller, a Danish gentleman sitting in Zurich working for Sky Guide, was working alone, and he was overwhelmed, and he gave the wrong instruction to the Russian crew. Our um, research show us that some cultures do not listen to machines. They listen only to human beings. So the Tupolev um, warning system, what we call the ground proximity warning system, went on five times saying, go up, go up. The air traffic controller alone, Peter Nielsen, kept telling the Russian crew, go down, go down. It seems that in this particular case, the Russian hurt much more the human being more than the machine. They went down, the DHL Boeing went down and uh, the accident happened, everybody died. A year and a half after, from Russia called Vitaly Kaloyev, who lost his uh, wife Svetlana, his daughter Diana, his son Konstantin, four and 10 years old kids, came to Switzerland, went to Klotin, where Mr. Peter Nielsen had uh, retired, looked for his house, rang on the door, stabbed him to death in front of his wife and three kids. So you see, this is what I call crisis have long roots. Sometimes you think we're done. The investigation has been closed. Um, the report has been written. Actually, it can have long roots. And nobody could pretend he controls what he doesn't control. And this is typically an episode where Mr. Kaloyev came and he committed the post-crisis crisis um, to the air traffic control. He was holding responsible for that. So this is um, typically what could happen if we if we were not sensitive to weak signal to the situation of Mr. Kaloyev and so on and so forth. Um, I'm not sure I have uh, the time to go through this, but I would like just to touch something on the Swiss cheese model. I would like you uh, to look at it. Um, it was invented by um, a British gentleman called James Reason. And I would like you to look at how a succession of holes in a cheese could end up by being a crisis. And we have negative and positive uh, examples. The Avianca 052 in 1990 is a negative one, but we'll see a positive one because we're running a little bit out of time. But please do visit the Avianca case where a plane uh, on a Thursday evening leaving Colombia with extra fuel end up by crashing on the house of the father of John McEnroe. Um, there was nothing wrong with the plane. It has 
um, extra fuel when it left Colombia, but it was succession of few things. One of them, the autopilot was off. The second thing, very, very poor weather, so they kept waiting, waiting, waiting to be clear to New York JFK. When you are waiting and flying low, you consume lots of fuel because the air is very thick when you're flying low. Number three, bad weather means stress and fatigue. At a certain time, even the captain, Captain Caviedes, asked his first officer, Captain Klotz, get me somebody from JFK Air Traffic Control who speaks Spanish. It's much easier for me. And the last thing, the very poor conversation between Mr. Caviedes and Mr. Klotz. And seven times, the, the, the captain, Mr. Caviedes, asked his first officer, please tell New York we are in emergency. And the first officer just kept saying, we need priority to land. We need priority to land. They lost engine one and two and three and four, and they crashed over John McEnroe's father's house. Uh, close to to Long Island, there was nothing wrong nothing wrong with the plane, or the gas, or the pilots. They were not on drug. They were not high. There was nothing wrong with the JFK piece. It's just a succession of many things. But now let me give you a positive example on the Swiss cheese model. When the Cuba crisis, the missile, the Cuba missile crisis happened in 1962, it was 11 days where the world was on the brink of a nuclear war. And um, on Saturday, 26 or 27th of October, uh, one submarine B-59 traveling very deep, so no contact with Moscow, no contact with anybody, got the feeling that the U.S. started the war. Actually, just a plane from the U.S. Air Force had launched a depth charge to signal to the submarine, you have to surface. This is a military code. And uh, they thought the, the war had started. So Captain Savitsky, um, the captain of the submarine, decided to arm a 10 kiloton nuclear torpedo. But he needed the agreement of the number two. This is the code in the, in the Russian um, Navy. And he got the agreement of the number two, uh, Ivan Maskolevich. But luckily for us, there was another officer called Mr. Arkhipov, because he was a Commodore, so highly ranked, he also had to approve. And he said, no, we don't launch. I don't believe this is the start of the war. And he entered into an argument and he held it tight against the grain not to launch the torpedo. Luckily, Mr. Arkhipov was on this submarine. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been here today to speak about crisis management. So this is the negative and the positive side of what I call the Swiss cheese model. It is enough that one person comes in and blocks a crisis, and this would take it from crisis to a near miss. Maybe a concluding question from me. Uh, from me, because there were, there were there are quite many questions uh, here, uh, which I'm sure will not be able to uh, answer. But there are some questions, uh, geopolitical questions, like uh, something about the third world countries. Uh, how can we uh, help them? Uh, there is a question on dependence uh, of Europe on China. Uh, there is a question on how can we... Uh, help the uh, international organizations, questions about business models, organizational structures, budgeting, leaders in the industry, boards, and so on. So a question, like a, a proposal from our side, please, please keep a dialogue uh, with us. What we could do right now, we could uh, also focus on leadership because there are a number of questions which have something to do with the uh, leadership style. For example, are the great crisis leaders born or made? So in other words, are good crisis managers born with predispositions to be such or maybe they learn through their experience and learnings? So th this is probably the most crucial question that everybody asks ourselves when they look up at their, uh, their leaders. I think all of us, we are, uh, we are born with the predispositions. And then, depending on the context, on our family, um, we, we become good in managing crisis, meaning we become good in taking stress and maintaining our composure under stress, meaning also we can filter the stress to protect our teams, our family, and also in sharing and being moderate. 
I would like to add one thing, if this is the last thing, but of course you, you just mentioned that uh, people can ask us a question um, through our mails and then we'll get back to them. Um, maybe one do and why one don't. Um, please accept that we don't have control. Please accept that not everything can be controlled and managed and modeled and budgeted. It's just normal. And the other thing one don't, never, never, never in crisis, never let other people lose face. Otherwise, we're creating a post-crisis crisis. And the other thing, please avoid any threatening or ultimatum. Um, it will not help. I was looking at, um, a week ago, I was looking at the news and I saw uh, a ministry of um, a minister of economics of one of these northern country lecturing the Italian uh, minister of economics on how poorly Italy has been managing their finance and debts and and so forth. So of course, Italy has a debt to GDP of more than 130 percent. Of course, all that is good, all that is, true, but the timing is poor. So a good leader should also choose timing, but again. Please accept we don't control and please avoid any threats or ultimatum and avoid that anybody loses face. This could potentially create a post-crisis crisis. I think we are, um, it's noon time. Um, I hope Marta and I were able to share with you uh, most of what we prepared. You have our emails, keep in touch. We'll be happy to get back to you. Um, if it takes some time, be patient, but we will uh, get back to you, either Marta or myself or both of us. I wish you all the best. Stay safe um, and uh, the sun will come up again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.